I think uh, Colonel Black pretty much summed it up. I, um, I'll just reiterate some of the points and, um, and maybe expand on them a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> we, we have a situation where deterrence, classic deterrence, is failing. Uh, and it's failing because in order for deterrence to work, both sides have to take the threat of their imminent destruction seriously. Um, Russia does take the threat of its existential survival seriously. Russia uh, understands that the United States and NATO have articulated uh, a grand strategy that seeks the strategic defeat of Russia. And if you're a Russian, that means that Russia as you know it no longer exists. Uh, the United States and Europe um, are seeking to have Russia return to the decade of the 1990s where Russia is or was uh, completely subordinated economically, politically, and even from a security standpoint to the uh, to the collective West. Uh, this is a a vision the West uh, seeks to embrace and 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 uh, you know get to to have reemerge. And it's one that Russia has rejected wholeheartedly. One only has to listen to the speeches of Vladimir Putin recently, uh, his inauguration address and, and his address uh, on uh, Victory Day. Uh, to understand that um, Russia today will never go backwards, will never allow that to happen, that Russia views a retrograde in that direction as an existential threat, uh, that Russia now defines itself as a nation that depends only upon Russia. It is a self-sufficient nation uh, that classifies itself as one of the great civilizations of the world. And Russia says, and its leader says that, um, a world without Russia is not a world worth living in. Um, and that's sort of his way of saying that if um, you seek our strategic defeat, uh, you seek your um, parallel demise. That's Russia's deterrence doctrine, that if you seek to destroy Russia, you shall be destroyed in return. Russia has warned the collective West, um, NATO, the United States, uh, that this issue in Ukraine, this special military operation, um, is something that it will not tolerate a direct Western intervention. And they've said that from the very beginning. Russia alluded to the fact that if NATO were to intervene, this would become a direct conflict between Russia and NATO, and Russia would use all the means at its disposal uh, in response. This means the nuclear um, Russia's nuclear weapons. And Russia doesn't believe in limited nuclear war. That's the other point that needs to be pointed out here, is that uh, for Russia... Um, once a nuclear war starts, it logically goes to general nuclear exchange. Uh, and so Russia doesn't believe that you can have a one and done. You can do a nuclear demonstration. Uh, Russia doesn't believe in usable nukes in terms of we can use these weapons and then, you know, contain the problem so that it doesn't expand. From a Russian perspective, once nuclear weapons are used, it will logically proceed to a general nuclear conflict. Um, and one of the reasons why Russia does this is uh, for deterrence value, so that people understand that there are clearly defined red lines that cannot be crossed. And these are reasonable red lines. It's not as though Russia is seeking to impose unreasonable conditions on the world. Uh, Russia simply says, do not seek our strategic defeat. Uh, do not attack us uh, with nuclear weapons. Um, do not try to acquire conventional military power capable of overwhelming us. Um, you know, because that would be a strategic defeat. We are not going backwards. We will use all the means at our disposal. Somehow the West doesn't understand this. First of all, the majority of the people who are so-called Russian experts or who are in a position to advise policymakers or the policymakers themselves uh, cut their teeth on, uh, you know, so-called Russian area studies during the 1990s, late 1980s, during the 1990s. These are the people who were committed to the exploitation of Russia. For them, Russian area studies wasn't about understanding Russia, but rather to understand how to best exploit Russia. Um, and it's this mindset, uh, their desire to have the West in a dominant position across the board, an intolerance for Russia daring to stand up and be treated as an equal that has put us in this situation. Their policies always seek to return Russia to the 1990s. There is no policy out there today in the collective West that respects Russia as an equal uh, and will not tolerate Russia as a superior. Um, but the fact remains today that Russia is in many ways the equal of the West and in some ways the superior of the West. Um, and this is intolerable. 
these nations have deluded themselves into believing that Russia is bluffing, that Russia is a paper tiger, uh, that um, what passes for you know the, a solid foundation of uh, national security is a house of cards, that if you blow on it, it shall collapse. They believe that Vladimir Putin's hold on power is tenuous. Uh, they believe that there are deep fractures within uh, Russian society. They believe that the economy um, is being artificially hyped and that it's very vulnerable to uh, to outside pressure and subject to collapse. Um, the bottom line is they don't respect Russian deterrence. And as a result, they are inclined to embark on policies uh, to achieve an unattainable objective, strategic defeat of Russia, policies which will cross Russia's red lines. Um, Colonel Black mentioned the French and the British ambassadors being brought into the foreign ministry to be read the Riot Act, uh, the French for uh, daring to say that they will deploy French troops into NATO and the British for saying that they will green light the use of British weaponry, the storm shadow to be used uh, as uh, it, to, to launch strategic strikes into the depth of Russia. Um, I'm, I wasn't there. The Russians haven't put out a, a readout of the meeting and neither have uh, France or United Kingdom talked about it. But um, I, I'd bet a dime to a dollar that the conversation went something like this. What you have articulated represents policies that are seen by the Russian government as presenting an existential threat to our survival. We have told you not to intervene. You now are articulating policies of intervention. Let us remind you that we will respond decisively. The de and, and by decisively, it means not just against terminating the threat as it exists in Ukraine, which we will do, but we will now strike decision-making centers outside of Ukraine to include the high probability of striking targets on your territory. Um, and if you choose to respond to that, understand that we will respond with all the weapons available to us. And this does mean nuclear weapons, and we will use nuclear weapons against you. I believe Russia did not sugarcoat this whatsoever. This coincided with Russia launching these uh, training exercises. These are not a bluff. This is not a game. This is the real Russian posture as it speaks. Vladimir Putin has articulated publicly that all decisions have been made. All decisions have been made. There will be no phone calls. There will be mo no discussions. At the appropriate time, if indeed France, the United Kingdom, or any other Western nation chooses to conduct policies or conduct operations inside Ukraine, squaring off against Russian soldiers, launching strategic strikes inside Russia, all decisions have been made. Russia will automatically respond. Now, normally, that would be enough to trigger the deterrence factor, where people would say, well, um, we're not willing to go there, so we shall modify our posture. Um, but what we have right now is a feeling in the West that this is pure bluff um, and that it's time to double down on what we're doing. You, uh, Chatham House, a, a major British think tank, just published a report that said that um, Great Britain should uh, you know, embrace the strategic ambiguity that the French have done. Well, there's nothing ambiguous about what the French have said. They said that we'll go into Ukraine. Russia has said, if you do that, we will attack you. And now the British are saying, well, we need to adopt a, a similar posture. This is very dangerous. We live in a very dangerous age. Uh, and this is a period of time when the United States needs to step up and provide leadership and to make sure that the British and the French know in no uncertain terms that um, the United States will not back, uh, you know, postures such as this. But the United States is silent. Indeed, in our own Congress, we have people uh, making noises. Now, I would say, thank goodness that Hakeem Jeffries um, is not in the chain of command. And so, frankly speaking, his words mean nothing. He can order no troops. Uh, he can't pick up the phone and call the Secretary of Defense with a meaningful conversation. Um, if he was the Speaker of the House, he still would have those limitations. But the Speaker of the House, you know, is a player who can make phone calls, um, not to direct, but to um, advise. But Hakeem Jeffries is a nobody. And so fortunately, you know, his, um, you know, his words can't be brought into action. But it is it should be noted that his mindset is reflective of the mindset of many members of Congress uh, who view the Russian posture as a bluff.
Um, and this is the danger. If you're going to have deterrence, both sides have to um, be cognizant of the fact that there are red lines which are across. Things will happen which they don't want to happen. Therefore, don't cross the red lines. But right now, the Russian deterrence, although it's soundly articulated and um, ably backed up with the evidence of the ability to carry it out, it's not being treated in a um, respectful manner by the West. And if the West doesn't view it as... Um, you know, as, as not being a bluff, then they will cross those red lines. And because the Russians have made it clear that their response is on full automatic, we may very well find ourselves waking up one morning and that will be our last morning on this earth. Because once a nuclear war starts, once nuclear weapons are used, this will rapidly escalate to strategic nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States. And, um, and then it's, it's too late. So, you know, what we need to do, what I believe we need to do is focus on educating people about the reality of Russian deterrence, that it is real. It is not a figment of anybody's imagination. And we need to work on um, getting Western policies to align. And one of the more difficult aspects of this is to get the West to let go of Ukraine. Uh, we have lost this. We, we, we poured hundreds of billions of dollars into this gambit. It has failed. Uh, Russia is winning and will win, and there's nothing that can be done to prevent this. Uh, no amount of storm shadows flying into Russia's strategic depth, no amount of French troops on Ukrainian soil will, um, you know, turn the tide. Um, the Russian victory is preordained. It's going to happen. The West needs to learn to deal with that. Um, and the best way to deal with that is to figure out how we can peacefully coexist with Russia in a post-conflict environment. Nobody's having this discussion. I'll just throw out uh, in conclusion, um, I, again, sometimes my ambition is uh, greater than uh, my ability to carry it out, but uh, I have engaged with the Russians to um, begin a process um, in February of 2025 on the 80th anniversary of the Yalta uh, conference to have a new Yalta conference uh, bringing together experts on international law to talk about um, a post-conflict um, resolution uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and then to follow up with uh, a new Potsdam conference uh, in Berlin on the 80th anniversary, uh, where Europe and Russia can begin talking about um, reconciliation in a post-Ukraine environment. Uh, there seems to be some interest. Um, maybe we can get more interest and maybe we can turn it into something that uh, not only happens, but the product of which uh, can be useful to um, guide policy both in Europe, Russia and the United States. Thank you very much for having me.